Is the mic working in the back? OK, all right. Uh, uh, if I could have your attention, please. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, could I? Right, so before I begin the lecture, let me just uh, say to you that you know you have a reading which has to do with Sri Lanka, uh, and uh, you don't have the text, but I will send you the PDF of that sometime this evening. Uh, it's not going to be the entire book. If you want the entire book, the syllabus mentions it. You can get, can get a Kindle edition or a paperback or hardcover edition as you please, but uh, you're going to do about 100, 125 pages uh, from that book. Uh, and also before I begin, so um, you know, I've mentioned to you uh, uh, the New York Times. I mean, I suggest that for the duration of this course, you should try to take a look at the newspaper uh, most days if you can, or you know, some other place. But I think they have a little bit more coverage. Uh, but this is today's uh, New York Times, and this is uh, page eight, and you can see a, a huge map of Sri Lanka, uh, which I'm going to be speaking about. I think it'll be useful to you. Yes. Well, uh, he said it is on. Turn up the volume here. Um, OK, how about now? Is that better? No? Well, I, I don't know uh, what I'm supposed to do. Um, how about now? This is on full, nearly. You see, it's showing a red light here. We're usually supposed to show a green. I've been told different things about Is that can, you, can you hear me? It's a lot better. Lot better? OK, all right. OK, so anyhow, this is a, this is a map which uh, it says a complex history of tensions among the sects of Sri Lanka. We'll talk about that later on, what they mean by sects when we get to Sri Lanka. But it's basically a map of uh, the religious composition uh, of Sri Lanka. You know, uh, it's, it's a useful map. Uh, and so if you get a chance, just just take a look at it. Uh, I don't think you need to have access to the New York Times if you're looking up only a couple of, a couple of articles. Uh, and also, um, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, the science pages of the New York Times, first page, in India, leprosy lives. Uh, it's a huge article, goes all the way to the back. So this is our great world power, or at least they like to think about being a world power. And you think about the fact that you know you you still have to talk about things like leprosy, you know you know when you talk talk about leprosy, most people immediately think about the Middle Ages or something like that. Uh, but it's there are there are a huge number of people. It's resurfaced. They thought they had eliminated it. They haven't. It's like measles in a way. If I may put it this way, it's not quite the same thing, of course. But what we're talking about is recurrent issues. And when we get to uh, the whole question of well-being in India, we're going to find that the range of these problems is really astronomical. Okay? But anyhow, as I said, it's, I think, uh, particularly in view of the fact that elections are going on in India today, um, I, I think uh, it would be worthwhile for you to try to see if you can take a look at the newspaper every now and then. So I've been speaking to you about the question of Sikh secessionism in India. Uh, I'd just like to take a few more minutes at most to wrap up my discussion of that, uh, because I have a fear that in the haste with which we sort of went, th went about it, uh, given the complexity, that uh, it may not be entirely clear to some of you who have absolutely no background in Indian history what this is all about. So I've mentioned to you, let me try to give you a capsule account uh, uh, of what is really at stake here, that, that you know, the Sikhs are, uh, 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 go back, their history goes back to, to uh, roughly around 500 years ago. Uh, there's been a persistent question, uh, which really continues down to the present day, as to who exactly the Sikhs are, whether they are really entirely different from Hindus or not. Uh, the Constitution of India is, in a manner of speaking, ambivalent on this question, because there are portions of the Constitution where it's very clear that the Sikhs and the Jains and the Buddhists are different from the Hindus. These are all dis adherents of different religions. And yet there are portions of the Constitution where Buddhism, Jainism, 
and Sikhism are all described as branches of the mother religion called Hinduism. Right? And that ambivalence is in fact echoed in the history of the Sikhs because as I pointed out to you in the 19th century for example there's a scholar who is at UBC now, the Harjot Abroy who wrote a book called The Risk Construction of Religious Boundaries which the Orthodox Sikhs absolutely hated. Uh, uh, and, and he, he uh, had uh, uh, you know, enormous problems uh, in trying to make himself heard, if I may put it this way. Uh, he, what he was trying to argue was that this border, this boundary between the Hindus and Sikhs was porous. Uh, they were Hindus who were participating in Sikh festivals and vice versa, but that's fairly common. But it was much more extensive than that, that it was actually in some instances quite difficult to to say that this is exactly what demarcated the Hindu from the Sikh, right? And then when we move into the 20th century, so I mentioned to you that there's a partition, and of course one of the, one of the communities that is adversely impacted uh, in its own particular way are the Sikhs, because when the Punjab was partitioned, and then a Muslim majority state was created um, in the West, of course in the East as well, the same nation but two different parts, uh, the Sikhs did not get their nation state. So there was, there was a, a certain sense of grievance about that. Um, and this demand for a Punjabi state, a Punjabi Subha as it was called, uh, kept on cropping up throughout the late 40s, 1950s, 1960s. Now in the 1970s I have to introduce another factor which I did not mention at that point in time. You get the Green Revolution in the Punjab. Uh, and when we look at when we look at the whole economic um, uh, sector uh, of things, and we look at the question of well-being and so on, we're going to look a little bit more closely at some of the factors surrounding the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is important as part of this political narrative too, because one of the things that the Green Revolution did. So of course, you know, some of you probably know what I'm talking about when I say the Green Revolution, but very briefly, what it meant was the use of certain methods of agriculture, so new hybridized crops, extensive use of irrigation. Um, there was an American scientist who was quite important in developing these new varieties. Uh, intensified agriculture. Now intensified agriculture is really only possible when you start to consolidate land holdings. So if you have very small land holdings, it's very difficult to have intensified agriculture. You know, if each farmer is basically a subsistence farmer, uh, growing for himself and his family, maybe for the local market at most, uh, you know, you have a small plot of land. But if you're, if you're obviously growing for a larger market, uh, particularly an export market, uh, one of the things that's going to happen also is by the way, nature of your crops is going to change. You're going to get more crash crops, for example, uh, rather than simply have, let's say, wheat. All right, so in essence what we're talking about is that this Green Revolution created as well a new class of Punjabi landlords. Now this intensified rivalries, it intensified class differences. Very often when you read accounts of the secession, secessionist movement in the Punjab, the political scientists who write about this, they don't really take account of this at all. They're basically giving you a political narrative, you know. But this had an important part to play because it created a ground swell of dissent, okay. There's, a, there's agricultural dissent, if I may put it this way, in the Punjab beginning particularly in the mid-1970s. Um, and incidentally, a little footnote. I like to add these footnotes because it suggests how many different trajectories we can go off in which we would never even think about. For anyone here in this room who studies South Asia, you know, you think about what your sources are. So, you know, there are 40 libraries in the United States which are designated PL 480 libraries. PL means public law, public law 480 libraries. So these are 40 libraries, including UCLA, which got a copy of every English language book published in India once the program was put into effect. What was the program? That India was importing huge amounts of wheat from the United States. It was not self-sufficient in food production. That was one reason why you needed the Green Revolution, okay? It was importing these huge amounts of wheat. Now, the Indian rupee is not a convertible currency. 
And so the Indians said, and they didn't have any foreign exchange reserves, of course, in India. It was a very poor country in the 50s. So the Indians owed the Americans billions and billions of rupees. And the Americans said, what the hell are we going to do with all of this? So you know what they did. This is part of the project of being an imperial power. You get to study the other. So they created a Library of Congress office in India, which purchased 40 copies of every book and distributed it to 40 libraries in the United States. I'm serious. It's called the PL480 program. And there are 13 libraries which got a copy of every book published in India. Doesn't matter whether it was in Hindi, Bengali, Oriya, Marathi. I, mean, I did my PhD from the University of Chicago, and when you go to the Regenstein Library, fifth floor, where they have the South Asia holdings, I mean, it is staggering. Yeah, row after row of books published in Marathi, you know, in Bengali that no one has checked out, ever. Well, that's what it means to study the other. You know, and you have the power to do so. Now, it's all related to the question of agriculture in India, the fact that India was not self-sufficient in food production. You have the Green Revolution. Right? And it, it exacerbates class divisions. Quick question, because I don't have too much time today. Sure. No, no, no. It, they, they, that, it, the, it, food production in India was very low. India was not self-sufficient self in food production to begin with. It had to import wheat. There are all kinds of allegations. I don't want to get into that, that the Americans sent the lowest quality wheat that they had, for example. Okay? Uh, but but those, are, those are complicated questions which we'd have to ho devote a whole segment to that. The gist of it simply is that in, in the Punjab, it, there was a new class of landlords and there was agrarian unrest because of sharpening class distinctions, partially in consequence of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution had other consequences down to the present day because, for example, now it has been argued by people who have really been studying agriculture in India that, well, for the first 30 years, yes, the Green Revolution really helped to increase dramatically food production, particularly, for example, wheat. The Punjab became the granary of India, the breadbasket of India. Okay? But that now, because of the methods used by this, basically that soil has been devastated for good. Uh, you find, by, by the way, that production rates have really gone down. In the Punjab, you find that the water table, you have to dig 150 feet down to get water. Uh, India has a severe, severe water problem. Okay, and it's going to get much worse. But again, we table that for the moment. So now, let, going back to this movement here that I'm speaking about, so what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is that you, there is this larger backdrop. Now there is a demand by some Sikhs for a separate state. The argument being that the Sikhs are deserving of a state of their own. Um, there were some demands which can be viewed as entirely legitimate, some which are highly questionable, highly questionable. Let me give you an illustration of each of them so that you understand what some of the demands are. For example, there are two states, Punjab and Haryana, bordering each other. Both of them have a shared capital, Chandigarh. The Sikhs said, we want our state with our own capital. Every other state has its own capital. Why should there be a shared capital here? Because then, of course, that has other implications. Revenues, apportioning revenues, how do you, how do you command the state government, etc., etc. What, what was an illustration of a demand that the Indian government said is absolutely cannot be negotiated? We cannot give that demand to you. The Sikhs have a thing that they call an object that is called a kirpan. Now when you translate that word, it immediately creates a set of problems. But you have to translate it if you're going to explain it to someone. It means a dagger. It means a dagger. And the, the Orthodox Sikhs have always claimed that the only way to understand this object is, if I may put it in this fashion, I'm using my own language, is that the dagger is to the Sikh identity what the crucifix is to the identity of a Christian. 
And you know, there was a famous case that developed in California, right? There were two children belonging to a Sikh family living in the Imperial Valley. If anyone here knows Imperial Valley has a, you know, Central Valley, I should write, you know, that Fresno area, all of that actually. There, there's a large Sikh population there, all right? Long history, going back to about 100, 125 years. Now, two children were going to a school, Sikh children, and they were playing basketball, and they had this kirpan, which is a dagger. So it's a knife. And it was sewn into their clothes, and one boy was playing basketball. Some white kid saw that, uh, you know, and went and complained to this. The principal reported it to the principal. The principal summoned the children and said, well, you know, you, you're not allowed to bring weapons. At the school code state said very clearly, you cannot bring weapons to school. The school code states that, the state code says it, and the children were told that they must bring their parents to school the next day. They were summoned, they were explained, and the parents said, well, that's, it's not a weapon, it's a religious object. And, and so, of course, the school principal said, yeah, but you know, you can kill someone with it, you know? Uh, and they said, well, it's never ever been used for offensive purposes. This is what a Sikh is supposed to carry on his or her body all the time, an Orthodox Sikh, an observant Sikh. I, I, I want to go through the whole history. The ACLU is going to get involved in it because now it quest, becomes a question of religious freedom. Very interesting argument in the court, for example, where the, 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 uh, at, the, uh, the attorney for the school and the states said, well, it's an object. And so the ACLU attorney said, well, tell me, uh, are baseball bats used in schools? And they said, yes. Well, what prevents a kid from taking a baseball bat and smacking the skull of another kid with the baseball bat. Right? And th then the attorney said, yeah, but it's never been used that way. And, and the attorney for this family said, well, a kirpan has never been used this way either. So over and so on. Interesting case, very interesting case. But now you understand, it's an object. So what was the demand of the Sikhs? That they should be, because they're supposed to have it on their body 24 hours, as it were, that when they travel on an aircraft, they should be allowed to carry it. The Indian state said, over my dead body, so to speak. <laughs> yeah? Because, of course, there are international rules, uh, apart from the security that, uh, that a state feels, right, it should exercise over its own subjects, so, so forth and so on. So this, this conflict is going, to, is going to get aggravated, and it is very important to understand that many of the people who were killed in the conflict were not just simply killed, uh, uh, killed by Sikh secessionists or Sikh terrorists, as the state called them, because they were state officials or functionaries of the government or senior journalists who had written against the Sikh secessionist movement. Yes, there were some people of that kind who were killed as well. But a very substantial number of people who were killed were moderate Sikhs. And they were killed because in some ways, this dispute got transplanted onto a Hindu-Muslim dispute. But it was fundamentally a problem within the Sikh community. And that problem has to do with the problem that goes back to the 19th century, which is who is a Sikh? How do you define a Sikh? What are the borders? Are these borders impermeable? Have there always been these borders between the Sikh and the Hindu? Right? And so this is going to be the, what is really the bedrock, I'm suggesting to you, of the conflict in many ways. And this Sikh secessionist movement is going to become increasingly violent. That I pointed out to you in my last lecture. You know, there are going to be bomb attacks in the city, bombs exploding in buses and railway stations. Um, uh, and eventually, what's going to happen is there's going to be this gun battle, which I described to you in 1984 at the Golden Temple. Uh, Bindranwale, whose name is mentioned over here, uh, is, going to, is going to be one, the, the leader of the movement, uh, is going to be killed uh, as a consequence uh, of this Operation Blue Star, uh, which is what it's called, which led to what the Sikhs described quite rightly as the desecration of the Golden Temple. Uh, but I say quite rightly, but I think it's also, of course, I think the case, um, which we should register, which is that, that the Sikh secessionists had used the sanctity of the Golden Temple 
as a place from where they were going to launch a war. They, they, they stockpiled it with weapons, stockpiled it with, with weapons. And then you have, you recall my discussion of that, the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi. The movement is going to peter out over some years. It, has, it had great support among the Sikhs in the United States, for example and in Canada. Uh, and it, it, as I mentioned to you, there is this whole idea of the creation of the state of Khalistan. All right. Um, that is sort of the gist, gist of it. Now, we've talked about Hindu communalism. And we've looked at, and, and particularly we, were, we had talked about the conflict um, in Ayodhya over the Babri Masjid um, and the resurgence uh, of Hindu extremism. Uh, this is really the, the new phase. Uh, it had always been lurking there. Uh, you know, they had been pointed out to you that the Hindu extremists had sort of gone into the wilderness uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, but then slowly they began to surface. Uh, and uh, the second episode then we looked at, or the second instance of this kind of conflict uh, uh, has, was uh, the conflict uh, in the Punjab. But now I want to look for, at my third case, because this takes us into the history of the rest of South Asia as well. Very complicated set of questions over here. Uh, and what I want to look at here is the transformation of East Pakistan. So this is Pakistan, right? In two fragments, and India in between. And what I want to consider here is the circumstances under which East Pakistan becomes a country which is now known as Bangladesh in December 1971. Um, uh, it is important to keep in mind some considerations as you lo listen to my narrative, which are not the kinds of considerations that you usually find, again, uh, if I may put it this way, in the standard historical account, and more particularly the account that political scientists, for example, have given of the nature of this conflict, because I think they have looked at it mainly uh, within the context of what I would describe as the geopolitical uh, arena, you know, that they were, the superpowers were th there as well. They, they, they were involved in some fashion, um, according to at least the political science view. Uh, my view is that we should really look at it largely as a conflict that started in South Asia and got resolved. Uh, in South Asia. Now the first fundamental difference is if you're looking at East Pakistan and go back to this map over here for a second, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, the first fundamental difference is that East Pakistan as it was then called and is predominantly Bengali speaking. And Bengali is not a language spoken in West Pakistan at all. West Pakistan, there would be several languages, but not Bengali. Uh, they would have been, Urdu would have been known here as well, but it, Urdu would not have been known actually to all the Bengalis. By any stretch of the imagination, it would have been known to more of the educated Bengalis. Bengali really was the language common to Bengali Muslims and Bengali Hindus. Right? And that's imperative. And in West Pakistan, you have, of course, you have uh, Urdu, you have Punjabi, Sindhi, Pashto, etc. All right. So that's the first thing that I think you should remember. Now, pa West East Pakistan, as you can see from this map, is much smaller. However, its population was greater than the population of West Pakistan. That's rather important. It's important because the question arises. Was there an economic basis to the division between the two as well, right? Uh, that is, was East Pakistan hurting economically? Because you could, of course, argue that the that the that that the demand for autonomy was a demand that arose from the fact that the historically the East Pakistan viewed itself as a very distinct area from West Pakistan. Uh, what was common? What was common, of course, was simply the fact that there were all Muslims. And then, of course, we have to go back to the two-nation theory that the Muslims constitute a nation unto themselves. And one reason why this is important is because this was as effective an answer to the two-nation theory as any that one can think of. That is what eventually transpired here, the fact that East Pakistan splintered from West Pakistan and then constituted itself as a separate nation. Now, if you look at this chart over here, Okay, so what is the spending on West Pakistan in millions of, re remember that the population of East Pakistan is a little bit larger than the population of West Pakistan, 
All right, and, and so if, you're, if we're looking at the periods from 1950 to 1970, 1971 is the year of the war, so we've got a 20 year period here, and the spending, that is the revenues of the state, what is the allocation, respectively to West Pakistan and to East Pakistan, you can see here as a percentage that the allocation for East Pakistan was never more than 50%. And in fact, and during this period, it went down to 31.7% of the total allocation, although there are more people in East Pakistan. If you were to do it simply proportionately by head, right, count the number of heads, then you should have, then we would say that East Pakistan's proportion of the revenues should have been somewhere in the vicinity of 66 percent, something all like that, 60 percent, whatever the case might be, right, should certainly have been a lot more than what it was. What we're talking about, it's not even a half, not even 50 percent of what went to West Pakistan, and this is consistently the case over the course of the 20 years. So which is to say that the people in East Pakistan felt economically disenfranchised, discriminated against, all right? Now, if you, if you, if you think about the political context, so what's going to happen is that if you keep in mind the economic redress, if you keep the whole issue of language in mind, um, that by the mid-1960s, there is going to be the demand for autonomy. Uh, and there's the rise of a person called Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, who is going to be the leader of a party called the Awami League. Yes? Was this taxes collected? Is this what? The, the tax is collected. No, the, we're talking about revenues. But we're, we're talking about expenditures. Expenditures. Not the taxes collected. We're talking about expenditures. What percentage of the state's resources are being allocated to West Pakistan and what percentage are being allocated to West Pakistan? Right? That's what we're speaking about over here. Okay? What's now. The the huh? Sorry? What's the source of the revenue? Oh, they could be. It could be, could be all kinds of, right? It can be land revenue, it can be sales tax. It can be liquor tax, it can be any number of things. We're not, we're not looking at the sources of revenue, although since you've asked that question, I'll tell you what the principal source of revenue, most of the revenue is actually coming from East Pakistan. Why? Because they have two items for export that the rest of the world needs, and West Pakistan doesn't have anything. What are those two items? Coast. Sorry? Coast. Tea and jute. You're thinking about the Beng Bangladeshi textile industry today, not 50 years ago. The two main items of export were tea and jute. And most of the industries were actually in, in East Pakistan. Okay, so the most of the revenue, so that the question is pertinent in that if we were to do a more detailed analysis, we'd say, so in the abstract, I said it could be anything, but now I'm giving you actually, concretely speaking, it was the revenue, the, the big revenue earner were these two export items, and these two export items are coming out of East Pakistan, not out of West Pakistan. So 1966, you have, 66, you have the rise of the Awami League. Uh, and Mujibur Rahman is going to initiate what is called the six point movement, right? So this is a six point movement over here. You'll have these slides available to you. Uh, I'm going to put them up this week, certainly, okay, possibly today. So basically a federation of Pakistan based on the parliamentary form of government with the supremacy of a legislature. Now you might say that, well, wasn't Pakistan, didn't it already have a legislature? Yes, it did. It had a federated system, but Keep in mind that Pakistan had already gone through many years of military rule. Right? And this is one fundamental difference between Pakistan and India. And that difference is that in Pakistan the involvement of the military was always much greater in the life of the nation than it was in India. And you, you've had long stints when, in, when Pakistan was basically under military administrations. Right? So, uh, in other words, you, you might, if you had to put it like in a short sentence, a demand that there should be a real working democracy with a real federated structure, not simply on paper. Right? Devolution of powers to provinces and states. So this is that same question of center-state relations. 
that we've had in India. Where here the demand is very explicit that the central government should really only be in charge of defense and foreign affairs and everything else should devolve to the provinces or to the states, right? Which would include things like agriculture, education, health, welfare, you know, economic welfare, all of that, right? All of these should be really adjudicated by the, by the states or the provinces, not by the central government. A separate fiscal and monetary policy. I think now you can understand why, in the light of what I've said thus far, why there should be a separate policy. In fact, Mujibur Rahman's Six Point Movement insisted that there should be two separate currencies for East Pakistan and West Pakistan. And partly it had to do with the fact that, the, that the, in East Pakistan the belief was widespread, which is substantiated by the economic data that we have, that essentially the monetary policies were all designed to benefit the population of West Pakistan, which is a population that is not just linguistically different, but we're talking about people who are Punjabis and Sindhis and so on, not Bengalis, right? The power of taxation and revenue collection should be vested in the provinces rather than, rather than coming from the center because there's a lot more accountability if it's coming, if it's vested in the provinces and in the states. And then the allocation is in those areas. It's not going to other areas, all right? Uh, there should be two separate accounts for the foreign exchange earnings of the two wings, right? Now, foreign exchange reserves was a very important question as it is for many countries in the world. Uh, and by the way, one of the ways in which you measure, um, uh, you know, China's uh, advancement, as it's called, is that China's foreign exchange reserves are absolutely astronomical today. I mean, if you, you, I have seen figures of as high as four trillion U.S. dollars, I, 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 don't, I don't even know what that means actually. How many zeros you have to add it after a point, you know? Uh, but. Uh, it's, it's really astronomical. And, and, and at this point, what you're really speaking about is that where is Pakistan earning its foreign exchange reserves? Through the exports, but the exports are all from East Pakistan. They're not from West Pakistan, right? So, so there was a whole question that there should, be a, there should be a very distinct policy on foreign exchange reserves, all right? And then finally, if you look at the map over here, of course it's not, it's just a simple geographic map, but it's enough for our purposes that you're talking about, I mean, there's obviously a ports over here as well, but then of the portion on the top here is landlocked, that here, you know, that, bank, that there should be the naval establishment for, for all of Pakistan should be based in, in Dhaka, in East Pakistan and that there should be a separate navy over there. So this is what is called the six-point program of Mujibur Rahman. So he initiates this movement. Um, the central government is not, of course, amenable to these suggestions. In West Pakistan itself, which, had, which was going through various kinds of turmoil, uh, you have the emergence of a man called Yahya Khan, who overthrows in, in a coup uh, his predecessor and then imposes martial law. Now, in 1971, just before 1971, they had an election. Let's try to understand. It'll take just a minute to understand, very simply, the, the implications of this election. Okay? So, there are 300 seats in the Legislative Assembly of Pakistan as a whole. That is, West Pakistan and East Pakistan put together. 300 seats. East Pakistan got 160 seats out of the 300 for the simple reason that East Pakistan had a greater population than West Pakistan. So the seats are apportioned according to the share of the population. Now, I don't think anyone in West Pakistan even remotely imagined that when they had the elections that a single party in East Pakistan would win 160 out of the 162 seats. The Awami League won 160 seats in that election. Now you know what, what the logical outcome should be. That the Awami League should now constitute the governing party for all of Pakistan. Right? Because it, it's by far the single largest party. The, the party in West Pakistan, which was the predominant party, was the 
Pakistan People Party, PPP, right? You know, the party that, that today the current prime minister represents didn't even exist at that time. You know, the current prime minister is Imran Khan, right? Former cricket player. Uh, it didn't even exist at that time. The PPP was the, was the party. And I don't think there was any expectation. Now, so obviously, once this election has taken place, Mujibur Rahman has every right to form the government of Pakistan, which is to say that if this right had been conceded, the government of Pakistan as a whole would now be based in Dhaka, in East Pakistan, rather than in West Pakistan. And here I cannot go through the elaborate set of negotiations and all the complications that ensued, but the gist of it is that this was not acceptable at all to the military and political elites, and particularly to the military elites in West Pakistan. Um, and because Mujibur Rahman has initiated this six-point movement, which is partially, a, of course, a movement for autonomy, and in West Pakistan is being interpreted really as a secessionist threat, things are going to get out of hand at this particular juncture. And what you're going to have beginning in early March of 1971 is you're going to begin to have a brutal repression unleashed by the West Pakistani regime. I mean, the one instance I want to just mention here uh, is that on the night of 25th March 1971, um, in what is called Operation Searchlight. I love these names that they always come up with in all of these countries for these operations. Operation Searchlight, right? And what is this searchlight? The searchlight is they surround the University of Dhaka which is the major educational institution with tanks and armored cars, and they basically mow down people. I mean, this is, and this incidentally is, as a little footnote, is worth registering because once again, you know, the word intellectuals is, is, uh, is a, a, a favorite word for many who uh, would like to think that, ah, these are people who are the real menace. You know, it, 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 it has been said often that in Cambodia, uh, when the Khmer Rouge conducted an auto-genocide, that is a genocide of its own people, uh, and killed two million people, uh, anyone who wore glasses was immediately killed, because the implication was that you probably read, you know, and, and therefore you were an intellectual uh, and a real threat to the state, you know. So they go to, a, they go to the uni Dhaka University in the night, surround the place, and essentially eliminate uh, the major intellectual center uh, in East Pakistan. Uh, the following month, General Tika Khan, who is going to be the officer commanding of the forces, uh, because remember that at this point, West Pakistan is, is still the headquarters, right? Uh, it's calling the shots. Uh, they're, they're the ones who, who, who appoint the officers. So General Tika Khan, I mean, he's nicknamed the butcher of, of Bengal. That's what he... Uh, butcher of East Pakistan. Uh, he's going to commence mass killings. Um, and it is no exaggeration to say that this is probably one of, one of the most horrific, unrecognized genocides in the 20th century. Because what you're going to have is you're going to have something in the vicinity of a million people who are going to be killed. Uh, at this point in time, you're going to have a large number of East Pakistanis who are going to start to flood into India, refugees. Six million refugees. You know, and I want you to think about it because now you're not talking about India as a country which, you know, is rolling in money and all of its people are doing spectacularly well. I mean, this is a country that's mired in deep poverty and then you get six million refugees. And I remember when I was growing up, they issued a special stamp. Uh, it was a five paisa refugee stamp. And so every time you posted a letter, you had to put that stamp on additionally because it was a way of generating revenues because who's going to feed these six million people? Who's going to give them shelter, clothing, schooling, right? And, the, and cost of feeding them was estimated to be about three to four million dollars a day, you know, which in India at that time, and it's still an astronomical sum, but certainly was. Uh, and of course, India's role here is not benign by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, of course, in West Pakistan, the view was that India would love to see Pakistan dismembered as revenge for what happened in 1947, that India was dismembered, and now India would love to see Pakistan in turn dismembered. That was certainly the theory in West Pakistan. Uh, I, I think there are probably people in India who thought that way. I would, I would doubt very much um, uh, that there weren't people uh, who thought that way. 
but whether that was in fact actually the principal force here is, I think, obviously a different question. Uh, but to cut to the chase here, what we're going to have is that eventually you're going to have, so you have a liberation force within Bangladesh, it's called the Mukti Bahini, which is basically a guerrilla force uh, of Bengalis uh, within East Pakistan, uh, and they're going to receive the assistance of the Indian state, and there's going to be an all-out war fought between India and Pakistan, um, which, will con which will conclude with the surrender, the unconditional surrender of Pakistani forces and the birth of Bangladesh on 16 December 1971. Mujibur Rahman is going to become, you know, the, the president, all right? Uh, now, I want to introduce a different consideration for a moment, uh, but before I do that, just show you some slides. Uh, so here is a, uh, this is a, a soldier who's peeking into a, this man's uh, dhoti to see if he has any weapons there. Um, rickshaw wallas who've been murdered. Uh, there's quite a lot of, by the way, documentary footage uh, on, on, on Bangladesh, uh, and there were some extraordinarily good photographers at work. Uh, uh, you know, people, and, and, uh, an old man um, carrying his, his father, yeah? Um, and this here is a very interesting document. So the Council General uh, of the United States in Dhaka um, and a number of American diplomats. So there's a book that was published some years ago. It's called The Blood Telegrams. Uh, blood here is not a metaphor. His name was Blood. Uh, but although everything is bloody at this point, I can tell you. Uh, so, he, he, so these blood telegrams uh, is, an, is a, basically this is a collection. It's, it's a book about the birth of Bangladesh. He also wrote a book called The Cruel Birth of Bangladesh. Uh, if you look at the text over here, it's quite important. Why? because a large number of American diplomats stationed in East Pakistan openly issued a statement saying the American policy here, this is before the war, but now the genocide is starting, right? Late March 1971, all right? This, this is April 71, so this telegram is sent some days after the Dhaka University mass killings, all right? And they send a statement to the Secretary of State and, and the American diplomatic establishment dissenting from the American policy because the American policy was overlook what's happening. Overlook what's happening, partly because of the geopolitical context. India was allied with the Soviet Union, right? There was a there was an India Soviet Union friendship treaty 1971, and Pakistan is basically being given assistance from the United States. Right? But but their view was so aware of the task force proposals on openness. So you know there had been a task force within the State Department which said that when officials disagree, we encourage them to openly disagree. I love that because it's the kind of thing that the State Department every five years will send you that. Of course, if you disagree, you you know your head is chopped off usually, right? Demoted or disappeared or whatever it is, and with the conviction that U.S. policy related to recent developments in East Pakistan serves neither our moral interests broadly defined, nor are national interests narrowly defined, right? So you can read the rest. They're basically issuing a statement of dissent because the idea was that, well, look, there's a genocide going on here, and we're just basically looking the other way, and we dissent with this policy. That, so that's where you, if we were doing a full-blown analysis, we'd obviously have to look at the geo political implications, and here is a map which shows you some of the military formations and all of that. Uh, this is an image um, of General Niazi, who is signing the instrument of surrender uh, at Dhaka. Uh, the uh, person, the Indian of, uh, uh, Army General, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, seated to his right, uh, is the general officer commanding um, there, and he's the one who accepted the surrender. And then, of course, this is what uh, th th this is the uh, this is the 16th December 1971, and it marks also the birth of uh, Bangladesh. And this is Mujibur Rahman, uh, whose daughter, by the way, is is uh, the major figure in the politics of Bangladesh today. 
All right. Um, now, um, before we get to a last set of considerations, um, I want to go back to the kind of thing that I'm suggesting to you is much more difficult to understand, and which I think is actually crucial. But it's not, it's not part of the narrative. If you go to the Wikipedia article, for example, or a standard historical narrative, even by a scholarly, you know, uh, in a, in a, written in a scholarly vein, uh, it will not really speak to that. See, I think that one of the central things here was the conception of Islam. All right? Because, yes, you can say that, look, East Pakistan, West Pakistan, they're all Muslims. You know? But these were very different kind of Muslims. They were very different kind of Muslims. We have to understand that in West Pakistan, the, is, the presence of Islam is substantially earlier than it is in East Pakistan, in Eastern India as a whole. Right? So if you look at the beginnings of the Muslim presence in South Asia, of course it begins on, in the West, um, and you have some people who are coming by sea, right? And then there are some people who are coming by land, and they're coming by sea. So if you, if you, again, all you have to do is really just look at the map and you'll understand exactly what I mean. So you've got Muslims who are coming, obviously, if you look at the cursor here, they're coming from the mountain passes, you know, through Central Asia, and then obviously Afghanistan, what is, you know, now Afghanistan and what is now Pakistan, and then into India. Right? Okay? Um, and then you have, you have, this is the Arabian Sea over here, this is the Bay of Bengal on the east here, but then there are Arab traders who are coming by sea as well. In both cases, the presence is much earlier. Now, secondly, we have to keep in mind that if you look at Bengal here, okay, because that's what the whole area is, it's called Bengal, right? That Bengal, what is one of the things that is quite distinct about Bengal is that the two major religions both came to it rather late. That is that Bengal was Hinduized and Islamicized both comparatively late compared to North India, South India. Partly it had to do with it being on the extremities, all the way to the east. Right? And then partly it had to do with the social and political structures, which I will not get into at the moment. But you, it, it is very clear from the scholarly work that's been done, that it is Hinduized comparatively later, much later than the Gangetic Plains, right? and Islamicized much later as well. In fact, actually, one of the interesting things is that when they did the census, um, uh, 1891, 1901, the British were horrified at discovering how many Muslims there were. They just had no idea how many Muslims there were. And these, but the, the, the area had been gradually Islamicized as well. When it was, and you, what you had was you had large segments which were Muslim and large segments which were Hindu. Okay? And the other way to understand it is that Islam in the West in the Punjab was much more intrusive, if I may put it this way. It, by intrusive here, I mean that it had entered into the pores of an society, okay, in ways that didn't really happen in the East, okay? And this is really the key that I want to point to. Of course, this is an interpretive move on my part based on the reading that I've done, right? But it seems to me that these are always the underlying things. And then when you start looking at the discourses, you begin to see how, you know, one can begin to see how some of this really comes into the narrative, although it's not transparent in the first place. And what, what is it that I'm referring to? That, you see, if you look at Islam in the East, in Bengal, there was a much greater proximity to Hinduism. Yeah, Hindu, Bengali Hindus and Bengali Muslims were really indistinguishable in most respects. They were really indistinguishable. 
and, Beng and Bengali Islam, if I may put it this way, was much softer than the Islam in the West. And the Islam in the West was comparatively much softer than the Islam of West Asia. The Islam of Saudi Arabia. So, so the degrees of softness, if I may put it this way, are greater and greater as you move east. And when I say softer, I mean many things. I mean, for example, that there are things under, that happen under Islam in that part of the world which would have been considered completely reprehensible. Where, where Muslims are taking on Hindu names and even though they read the Quran and, right, and believe in Allah and believe that Muhammad is his messenger, that they still are worshipping Hindu gods. They're doing all of this simultaneously. And there are hundreds and thousands of imperial records from the late 19th century that the colonial state itself produced, much against its own will, because these colonial ethnographers are going, they're documenting, and they're constantly running into people who are there saying, we don't really understand them. They claim to be Muslims, but they're following Hindu practices. They claim to be Hindus, right? But they are burying the dead, not cremating the dead. So forth and so on. They're constantly puzzled, befuddled by this. Because they, what they would like to do is they'd like to have neat categories. They say, ah, you're a Hindu, you're a Muslim. Life is simple. You know? And then you get these people who are obdurate, cussed, you know. They basically won't follow the rules, but they want to be everything together. They want to be Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh. Right? This, this is the frustration in the colonial record. And what I'm suggesting to you is that this was actually very important. Because when this conflict breaks out between East Pakistan and West Pakistan, it is also a conflict between the Punjabis in West Pakistan and the Sindhis who are saying... Punjabis in particular were really, who dominate Pakistan at that point, okay, were really saying that, you know, your Islam, they're saying to the Bengalis, is really completely inauthentic. Although they themselves are being told by the Muslims of West Asia, your Islam is inauthentic. And of course, one of the things that's happened in the last 40 years in particular, 1978, so seven years fast forward, you a man called Zia ul Haq is going to become the martial law administrator in Pakistan. Yeah. And what is now called the Islamicization of Pakistan, many people date to that. Of course, I would date it back much earlier. But you can begin to see very clearly, for the sake of convenience, we'll say 78. Right? You can begin to see the influence of the Saudi model. The Saudi model. You begin to see a lot more Pakistani Malvis, the Qazis, judges, preachers, okay, priests, intellectuals going to Saudi Arabia to get educated there. Or to get poisoned, as I would put it. You know, because I consider that to be probably one of the greatest poisons in the world is this Saudi version of Islam that has percolated all over the world. You know. I mean, talk about a menace, that's it, probably, you know. But anyhow, that's my own view, but that's what's happening. Okay? Is the, what you have here is the, in a sense, the rudimentary beginnings in a different way. Not really, a, and you can, by the way, you know, you have to really read into the documents and then you begin to see how it's coming out. Uh, you know, so these Hinduized Muslims of Bengal, are being characterized in official reports written by military intelligence officers as too contaminated. You know? That why, why are they even Muslims at all? Why are they calling themselves Muslims? They should really call themselves Hindus. So on and so forth. Yeah, Shuvan. Yeah. So the, you, know, you point out that uh, the Islam in Bengal is more, you know, feminized? Yes. It's in general, yes, in general, but, it, but, but Bengal particularly, the worship of the goddess, for example, shak, the Shakto tradition, Shakto is the worship of the Devi, the goddess, 
You know, Bengal is the what is the big celebrations there? Durga Puja. The goddess figure is all powerful in the Bengali imagination down to the present day. That is the biggest festival, Durga Puja, Kali Puja. Yes. Yes. Would you still say today that it's still softer than Saudi Arabia and closing the gap, or has that gap closed? Well, that, th so what is happening in Pakistan today is the evisceration, the elimination of everything that is viewed as inimical to a pure version of Islam. So, for example, a great, great Kaval. Kaval is a singer, a great Kavali singer of Kavalis. Okay. A, one of the greatest Kavals was murdered in broad daylight on the streets of Karachi a couple of years ago. Right? Why? Because the Sunni Saudi version says music is haram. Haram is forbidden. Completely forbidden. And, and I don't take the view, there are some people who take the view that Islam does not tolerate music at all. I, I think that's, that's not a view that I would accept. But, but that is a view that the Wahhabi version certainly has. You know. So that, that, that's one illustration of what's happening here is the, that, you see, but there's another way of looking at it. And that is that you know, Pakistan is part of the Indic world. That's its moorings. It comes out of the Indic world view. Indic meaning having to do with India, right? That's, for, that's the space it has inhabited for centuries. What the Muslims of Pakistan are being told is your real home is not east to India. Your real home is Saudi Arabia, Mecca. This is the real home of Islam. And you must conform to it. And everything that's been happening in the Pakistan in the last 40 years in this, in this respect is to gravitate, move Pakistan in that direction. So certainly, by the way, in comparison, to the, 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 a lot of the, lot of the Wahhabi-inspired versions of Islam view Pakistan as still inauthentic. Right? But that's, it, it's, like, it's like the Islam in Indonesia. I mean, I can't really get into a full-blown discussion of that. But again, Indonesia has a huge, it's the largest Muslim population in the world. But you never hear about the Muslims of Indonesia, partly because the supposition, and I have to say that Western scholars have contributed to that supposition. If you look at how Islam is studied, what the Near Eastern Studies Department does, you know, it still takes this, I, the model is, ah, the Arab world is the real location of Islam. Why is it the real location? When you have 600 million Muslims in South Asia, and 200 50 million in Indonesia, that's over 800 million Muslims. That's more Muslims than the whole Arab world, easily. Right? So forth and so on. Okay? Um, so what I'm suggesting to you is we cannot view this simply in the traditional categories of economics and politics. That's what I'm suggesting to you. All right? Uh, that there are a great many other considerations. Um, my endeavor here is to is to try to bring, not simply nuances, but to bring into consideration what are some of the points that I think may help us to an understanding, not simply what transpired there in 1970-71, um, but what continues to have repercussions down to the present day. Okay. Now, um, finally, before I close my discussion of politics, so. We've looked at India, we've looked at South Asia, we've looked at a whole set of considerations. I want to take five minutes to sort of bring in the wider, um, uh, put all of this within a wider ambit, which is that India was not simply because Gandhi came out of there, although that was important because Gandhi was uniquely a world historical figure in ways that almost no one was in many ways. Um, and obviously it was a source of inspiration for many. Um, but w w India was unquestionably very important uh, as a source of ideas, as a source of inspiration for decolonization movements around the world. So India was a big supporter of 
the anti-apartheid struggle uh, in South Africa. Uh, and, and again, there are all kinds of complexities, once again, here, which uh, I'm simply overlooking for the sake of convenience over here, because you know, in South Africa, you have a substantial Indian population. The origins of this go back to Indian indentured labor to Natal, um, and um, you know, th th that is in part uh, the backdrop for trying to understand how is it that Mohandas Gandhi uh, spent over 20 years in South Africa before he returned to India in January 1915. Right? Um, and in South Africa, there's certainly been tensions between the Africans and Indians. I, 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 that's been the case. I mean, when you have different multi-religious, multi-ethnic groups, that's going to happen. But it is, it is a matter of record. Uh, that India was a very strong supporter of the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, and you know, when South Africa uh, finally became free, when Nelson Mandela was, was released, and, and they had the first elections in South Africa in 1993, uh, and the end of apartheid, uh, when he constituted, when he and the ANC, African National Congress, constituted the first government, uh, Mandela appointed a disproportionate number of Indians to the first cabinet, Indian South Africans. And partly this was in recognition of the role that Indians had played in the anti-apartheid struggle as well. Now, the India's position on Israel and Palestine, I will get to in just a moment, because I want to look at that in slightly greater detail. Uh, but India also tried to chart out a path of neutrality. So it, it actually is one of the major forces behind what becomes known as NAM. The acronym is NAM, Non-Aligned Movement, right? Um, which is to say that it took a position of neutrality during the Cold War, that it was going to support neither, neither the U.S. camp nor the Soviet camp. Uh, and, 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 and remember that the India-Soviet Union friendship treaty that I'm talking about is 1971. That's much later, right? And that's partially because by that point in time, India, for geopolitical reasons, realized that it needed the backing of a superpower in, in the conflict that was beginning to emerge uh, in that part of the world. Uh, so there's this major conference uh, in Bandung. Bandung is in Indonesia in 1955. Um, and this is a conference of, of um, uh, the colored peoples of Asia and Africa. So it's, it's also basically nations that were non-aligned. Uh, and again, India had a major part to play in that. So I've already talked about uh, the Indo-Pakistan war. Uh, and I have constantly been hinting you know, throughout this course at, as India's claims to be an emerging power. I will omit this relations with US, Russia, China, uh, Japan, uh, because there will be occasion, particularly when we get to week 10, and when we begin to think about the future of India, to really look, look at that, and similarly with the nuclear power. However, last big consideration, which is, and I, and I picked this one, again, because of the, the long-term view tells us something else. And if you take a straightforward kind of real politic view, then it tells you something different, right? And of course, what I'm here I'm referring to is, I want to take a look at the what I call the eternal law of politics, which is that there are no permanent friends and enemies, right? These, these can change. Uh, there might be two countries at war with each other, and then 50 years later, they're very close to each other. Uh, and um, countries that have been abandoned by other countries and then again rise to the fore for various reasons. So there are these shifting alliances. And here I want to take the illustration of India and Israel. India did not confer diplomatic recognition on Israel until 1982. Right? And so if you said to yourself, ah, the reason it didn't do it is because India, like all other countries, or like many other countries in the world, was unfortunately shaped by the culture of anti-Semitism. Right? You, let's say you said to yourself, that's the reason why it didn't. And I want to suggest to you that as exactly not the case. OK? We'll get to that in just a moment. So why is it that India did not confer diplomatic recognition on Israel until 1982? Well, let's run through a couple of reasons briefly, just thinking about it, right? Well, one of them was, is it because of the fact that India had a very large Muslim population, right? I mean, that even after partition, you know that a large number of Muslims stayed behind because Muslims were spread throughout the country, of course, 
and now of course as you know India has as many Muslims as Pakistan does even though Pakistan was created as a Muslim majority state to which all the Muslims would go from India that's one of the things that irks the Hindu extremists right they're constantly talking about why what are the Muslims doing here we just gave them Pakistan why don't they all go there right? that's that's in short the view right so is it is it because that in this conflict that was emerging in the Middle East and that countries were called upon to take sides that India said that yeah you know look we don't want to antagonize our our own Muslim population by siding with Israel so is that the reason why it didn't confer recognition diplomatic recognition on Israel um, or is it because of India's dependence on oil India is, is largely dependent on oil uh, China also imports a large amount of oil if you look at China today but China still has a lot more reserves you know okay and China's source of oil is more diversified for example India gets a significant percentage of its oil from Iran now, that's becoming a huge problem because if you've been reading the newspapers you know what Mr. Trump has done right that he has removed these waivers um, effective Monday e effective May 1st because the whole idea is you want to shut out Iran completely that's what the US would like to do right or is it the case that India didn't give this recognition because of Cold War alliances right B by by which I mean that as you've heard me say Pakistan is going to start to ally itself with the United States okay United States is closely allied to Israel right so it's looking at these geopolitical contexts it's a very simple illustration we could we could we could broaden it out but just very simple illustration right and how did India's posture of non-alignment so I'm, I'm actually just describing it as a posture. Some people might say India was not really ever non-aligned. So I don't want to take a position. That's why I say posture. All right. I think India was non-aligned. But whether it was a posture or otherwise, did its posture of non-alignment factor into its view its, and its foreign policy that we're not going to grant diplomatic recognition? Okay. And that this remains a position until 1982. Now, before we go to the 1980s, what happens when we take a historical view, a long-term historical view? You can't take a long-term historical view of India-Israel relations because Israel didn't exist before the 40s, right? But a long-term view of India's relations with the Jewish population. So India has a very long history of Jewish presence in the land there are several distinct Jewish communities not one so there's a Cochin Jews now unfortunately only seven in number seven literally seven okay and that was not the case before it used to be a few thousands and then you have the Baghdadi Jews and one of the most distinguished families with an international history but that history started in India is the Sassoon family Okay, the Sassoons, who built a huge empire and extending into much of Asia, Europe eventually, London, Paris, Berlin, Shanghai, right? But it started in India, the Baghdadi Jews, the people who had, who, who had come from Iraq. And then you have what are called the Bene Israel. Number of different communities. And what is extraordinary, this I do take pride in however wretched the Hindu nationalist government might, might be today which is that India has no history of anti-semitism at all none whatsoever and you don't have to go by my verdict I mean I give you the verdict of one American scholar okay there are many others Nathan Katz in Florida who wrote a book called who are the Jews of India UC Press 2000 Jews navigated the eddies and shoals of Indian culture very well. They never experienced anti-Semitism or discrimination. And we're talking about a history, by the way, that goes back 2,000 years. Right? We're not talking about 19th century. The Baghdadi Jews is much later, but the Cochin Jews is much older. All right? And then he goes on to describe in what respect India could have served as a model for the world. Quote, Indian Jews lived as all Jews should have been allowed to live free, proud, observant, creative, and prosperous, self-realized, 
full contributors to the host country. And, th and this is a verdict that's been endorsed by every scholar who's worked on the history of Jews in India. So then it seems all the more surprising that India should not have had diplomatic relations with Israel right? until 1982. What happened? Right? What was the thinking over there? And this, by the way, is from Kerala. The inscription on this slab belonged to the synagogue in Cochingao. It was built in 1344. A synagogue that was built in 1344. All right? And there are many synagogues in Kerala, going back for several hundreds of years. Right? And absolutely no history of this kind of anti-Semitism that you find all over Europe and most of the world. Right? Now, um, let's, rather than going, taking the very long-term view, now we take, go back to the 20th century, that what was the understanding that Gandhi and the Indian National Congress had of what was happening to Jews all around the world? Now, I wrote a very long article, which I'm happy to email to anyone who wants, on Gandhi, Palestine, and the Jews, uh, where I look at this whole set of questions. And Gandhi writes an extraordinary piece uh, in one of his newspapers called Harijan on 2nd November 1938, simply called The Jews. It's a four-page article. But basically what he really argues there is that, look, you know, I've been surrounded by Jews all my life. I've had Jewish friends. His per first private secretary in South Africa was a Jewish woman. His patrons and benefactors were Jews. Herman Kallenbach, for example, Polak, right? Um, people like that. Um, and he was well read in the history of that period and he says my sympathies are with the Jews but in this short four piece page he eventually says I cannot reconcile myself to the idea of this being only a Jewish homeland and of course you know there's a whole history already by the time he's writing in 1938 I mean there's already a history of migration of Jews it was partly a policy of Zionism and, and partially a po po policy of repopulating that part of the world, you know. Right? So in short, what I'm saying is that the Congress, even party, even though, it, even though all of its members were, had feelings of sympathy and friendliness towards the Jews, I don't see any anti-Semitism in any of them at all. Nonetheless, it was very clear that the idea that this was going to be a homeland only for the Jews because that would entail what Gandhi and Nehru are talking about in the 1930s, that the Palestinians, the Arab population, is going to be driven out. You know. So essentially, they take the view that we are, do not support this demand for a Jewish homeland. And what's interesting also, by the way, is in World War II, you have one of the most dramatic instances. When countries such as the United States, by the way, were turning away Jews by the droves, you know, the abandonment of Jews, that India, the only reason India couldn't take more Jews than it did was because India was a British colony. A British colony. In British India, they did not allow Jews. But remember, go back to lectures first week. One third of the country was native states. And in one of these native states, the case of Maharaja Digvijay Singhji of Navanagar, he takes in a thousand Jewish and Christian orphans from Poland. Right? Uh, and this is, by the way, a report from the Times of Israel, the Indian Oscar Schindler, he is called, right? How he, how he took in these people when everyone else was turning them away. So you see, it's, a comp see, it's actually, you think to yourself and you say, well, we have to understand why did India adopt the view that it did towards Israel. And then finally, it grants diplomatic recognition in 1982. I think, and of course, I mean, the reasons why it did, that's going to be a long, complex analysis of shifting alliances. That's, I started out with that. You know, uh, and of course, I'm going to suggest to you, this is Hindu nationalism is beginning to emerge. And that is going to begin to change the contours of Indian foreign policy as well. Right? And what's going to happen beginning in the 1980s, you, you know, in Israel, as all of you know, this mandatory military service, and I can't tell you how many Israeli soldiers I've met
who come to India after they've had this grueling two, three year, depending on whether you're man or woman, two years for women, three for men, they come to India, cheap to live on, plenty of hashish, marijuana, whatever you want, you know, you can get by on $50 a month, that's their view, kind of, you go to these outposts, and now you can't even find menus in English in some of these places, they're all in Hebrew. You know, it's like an Indian, I feel like a foreigner now in some of these places within India. Seriously. Uh, like I went to Pushkar some years ago. I was sh absolutely surprised at what I saw. And then these retired Israeli generals who find consultancies and jobs. Um, I made a mistake here. Uh, I was talking to someone and had made the same mistake at that time. But uh, India's second largest supplier of defense equipment is now Israel. Uh, after the after Russia, uh, Russia has been a supplier for a long time. It gets its MiG aircraft, uh, fighter jets from Russia, um, and there is also another geopolitical consideration, namely this perception that India, Israel, and share, and and the U.S. all share something in common. And what is that something in common? That what that something is in common, according to this view is that all of these three countries are democracies which are now under threat from Islam. So there is a concerted attempt to try to create this kind of nexus between India, Israel, and the United States. So what's happening here is, in short, in conclusion, this is the triumph of the geopolitical view the abandonment of the civilizational view. The civilizational view says that, well, we have to look very differently. We have to look at the history of relations between India and Jews over a very long period of time, right? This is, the geopolitical view simply says, who the hell cares about whether we discriminate against Jews or not, whether we were hospitable to them, whether, you know, uh, we, care enough about you know, the reason we're going to have kosher restaurants with kosher menus is because yeah you know we need this tourist supply right you now you have restaurants such as this one okay a bit yavo and if you look at this india's first kosher restaurant kosher food I mean, the menu at least is in english many of them as i said menus are now in hebrew right this is the change okay we stop over here there's never enough time <laughs>